Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, all of you and welcome to uh, the webinar from IPRA uh, this May of 2023. Um, a couple of hours earlier than uh, normal, um, I hope that's been fine for, for you also. Um, and I'm delighted today to welcome uh, Lukas Bocinek, um, who is Managing Director for Switzerland, Belgium and the UK for the PR agency LIDAR in uh, Switzerland. Um, he oversees international client relationships for that agency. Lucas was a former co-director of the Executive Certificate Advocacy and International Affairs in Geneva, and is also an author. He wrote a book called Advocacy and Organizational Engagement. Uh, Lucas holds a PhD in Management Studies from the University of Neuchâtel, which I seem to recall as a rather fabulous wine area in Switzerland. Um, and he also has an international corporate and uh, uh, degree in commercial law from King's College in London. So, Lucas, uh, you're very welcome. And you're here to talk about uh, environment, social and governance, the new normal for public affairs. I shall now disappear from the screen and be back for the Q&A towards the end of the program. And uh, to everybody, do remember you can ask, ask questions anytime you like. Just write them into the Q&A tab and I will take them uh, at the end of the session. And you can also put your hand up um, and I can invite you to stage if you would like to ask questions at the end uh, in person. So goodbye for now and over to you, Lucas. Perfect. Thank you so much, Philip. And thanks a lot for everyone for uh, joining us. So the subject today is how the ESG is defining the uh, agenda and the practice of public affairs and also on communications. And we'll be uh, looking at it from a perspective of first looking into the trends that are shaping the landscape and that are shaping the uh, ESG context and sustainability context currently. Then we'll be looking at how to navigate this uh, landscape. And I brought into this presentation several results from the studies that we've been doing over last few years, looking at different aspects of ESG and sustainability. So on one hand, it's strategic integration into the um, into the organizational strategies of the companies and organizations, but also looking at the consumer uh, perceptions of ESG and of sustainability and how that impacts the trust to the uh, to the to the to the brands. At the end, we will have a little reflection of what is upcoming for public affairs and what is upcoming for communications functions, claiming that actually. Right now, it's a good time for public affairs and communicators within the organizations because how ESG is being shaped actually brings uh, uh, those functions up front because that's where the difference uh, will be made. So uh, looking a little bit into the, into the current context, and uh, uh, so quite a few of the following slides are based on different sociological studies looking across the world and uh, with a special focus on uh, on Europe, on the uh, societal trends that are shaping the perceptions of both ESG and sustainability and the policies from the business perspective. So what we are seeing right now is that the levels of discontent in society are extremely high and it was further fueled by COVID-19 and now with the uh, economic crisis. So what we are seeing from a from a from a customer perspective, we are seeing people that are in principle angry and are not really uh, very predestined to trust the organizations and companies. What we are also saying is that the push for the change is uh, imminent, and we see that at the different layers of sustainability. If you think about uh, multiple actions that are happening right now on the level of, of, of climate change, for example, and the pushes uh, uh, that grassroots movements are uh, producing towards the regulators and towards the companies, the action is expected to happen immediately. And this change needs to happen and be proven immediately as well. And that's changing quite a lot because on one hand, we have this paradox of the long-term ambitions of the companies and in the industries. Let's think about, for example, net zero pledges for 2050, in some cases, 2040, 2030. On the other hand, people are very impatient. So how to bridge that gap is really uh, where the public affairs and communication needs to come into, the, into play because the long-term ambitions need to be still communicated from a short-term perspective and being able to prove how the journey is actually happening and how the ESG is changing the uh, organizations uh, 
in a in a short term as well. Then what we are also seeing, and you know, uh, that the radical transparency is defining political agenda, and we will be seeing even more so more that, of that with the artificial intelligence. And a lot of the ESG discourse is about the disclosures, and it is about communicating of what we are doing and reporting that. And uh, by the access to the uh, to the information that it's uh, so simple and that it can uh, crawl through the through the data in a, in a, in nanoseconds. It means also that the uh, communication around sustainability and communication around ESG needs to change and needs to be uh, taking that uh, into account. And again, uh, showcasing uh, reporting goes further than just the uh, disclosures that are happening in the reports, but needs to uh, be communicated consistently across the channels. Then what we are also saying is that there is a lot of uh, change in the style and in the style of the organization. Some of the policies uh, remain in place. And again, that creates the expectation gap between the end customers and the organizations and bridging that gap and communication and public affairs play an important role in bridging that gap and bringing that alignment between the external expectations, perceptions, and what uh, the organizational strategy is uh, driving. Then on the regulatory front, we see that the changes are happening faster than ever. If we look at the Green Deal on the on the ESG or CBAM regulations at the at the EU level, what we are saying, what we are seeing really is that uh, from the disclosure perspective, the ESG creates a, a level playing field between the organizations and between the companies. Therefore, in order to take really advantage and differentiate ourselves from the perspective of sustainability, uh, we need to really have a very clear communication and public affairs strategy and being really able to uh, to communicate our ambitions on one hand, our disclosures, and then the progress towards them. And this is a big change because it is uh, um, because uh, right now, really, the role of public affairs is less and less in shaping the regulations and shaping the way how the ESG will be operating in regulatory framework. It is becoming much more about uh, developing the differentiating factors and being able to really uh, communicating the uh, strategies of the organizations because at the end of the day the reports are being increasingly aligned to the regulatory expectations and that's definitely a big shift that we are observing right now then uh, what is also important is that uh, uh, to note is that there is no uh, gain that is uh, happening forever and discourse can always shift and this is really visible in the space of sustainability and ESG because uh, the regulatory landscape is evolving so fast and across the jurisdictions that it is important that really public affairs professionals stay on top of those developments and are able really to help the organizations to align themselves across the geographies and jurisdictions in order again to benefit from the aligned approach to the sustainability and ESG disclosures. So that's a little bit on the context, but how to navigate the ESG challenges. And here we are looking at different aspects of it from the from the strategic perspective, from the public affairs perspective, also from the reporting perspective, and going down to the role of the function at the end. So what we see here is definitely the opening up of the of the eco chambers and that means that promoting the discourse becomes extremely important and extremely critical in order uh, to be able to drive the agenda and obviously the esg becomes a top priority in the corporate world this happens from several perspectives and we see on one hand the drive from the consumers in the multiple uh, countries who are becoming more socially and environmentally conscious and who are requiring the companies to uh, be uh, to, to, to speed up their uh, implementation of the ESG and sustainability strategies. We see that push from the investor side. There are and there are quite a few studies that also prove that the uh, ESG conscious funds are performing better 
uh, than the classical ones. So it is a good business to invest in these sustainably conscious companies. And at the end, it is also a pressure from the uh, regulators and legislators in multiple countries, both on the reporting side and on actually changing the corporate practices. However, when talking about uh, ESG reporting, it is uh, ESG is a lot about the reporting. And uh, uh, one can say that the traditional way of reporting ESG uh, doesn't really necessarily work anymore. We are seeing a multiplication of the standards and alignments. So uh, the agenda used to be defined by the sustainability and sustainable development goals established in uh, UN in 2015, which were supposed to drive the cooperation of the private sector and uh, uh, and uh, and the governments and, and NGOs in, in achieving those goals. It got deviated at some point towards 2019, towards the disclosures and reporting of the ESG within the framework of the uh, multiple uh, uh, protocols. We have GRI and SASB, which are two biggest ones, but also uh, other 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 disclosure um, mechanism. And it is interesting to see that shift because uh, uh, multiplication of those standards and uh, it was calculated that there were over 600 different uh, reporting provisions globally in both regulations and voluntary standards led to the regulators willing to uh, uh, align the reporting on the ESG side and choose the preferred uh, set of recommendations and guidelines. The issue right now is that it's difficult to say how the good and how the best looks like because multiple companies report according to multiple standards that are not necessarily fully aligned with each other. What we are seeing also as a second trend, which is extremely important, is that we are moving from the soft load, so those reporting standards, towards the hard loads, so the non-financial disclosure of the companies in multiple jurisdictions is touching the companies that are smaller and smaller in size. We are seeing that at the EU level with the uh, companies progressively uh, being uh, obliged to report on their ESG performance in the coming years. And this is a big, big shift because at the end of the day, it is moving us from this multiplication of the standards and uh, misaligned standards of reporting towards a common framework that will be uh, that will be equal for all the companies. At the end of the day, uh, from my perspective, it will be creating an equal playing field and it will also create a lot of opportunities from the perspective of on one hand sustainability engagements on the other hand from the public affairs and communications professionals then that obviously leads also to the expectations gap because on one hand we have the uh, requirements we have the standards of reporting on the other hand we have the expectations from both the and consumers, the regulators, legislators, and the civil society. And bridging that gap becomes paramount uh, in order to establish successful sustainability and ESG strategies. Still believing that the uh, sustainable development goals can be that framework because they really align the uh, activities of the governments, companies, and NGOs, and cr can create a platform for dialogue that goes beyond the ESG reporting and that elevates the dialogue towards the level of sustainability and action. And I believe that that's a next step really in the ESG discourse and discussion. We moved from CSR towards sustainability, then we moved towards ESG reporting and being very heavy on the reporting and disclosures. And now while reporting and disclosures become mandatory, next step will be all to get back really to sustainability and to the action and to the uh, creating of the common platforms between different actors. Again, it is, in my opinion, a great opportunity for the public affairs function to really be able to drive that agenda and uh, become a good partner within the organizations, driving that strategy internally and externally. Then obviously those new reporting tools will be need to be used uh, uh, with care. And that will also lead to the, uh, to the, to the important changes in the discourse. And here in the next slides, uh, I will present you a couple of uh, results of the research that we've done 
recently about some of the major discourse influencers when it comes to ESG. So when we look at the broader themes of the EU Green Deal, ESG and sustainable investing, carbon neutral, carbon negative, net zero sustainability, we see that uh, we have very much of the usual suspects who would be driving the discourse. So on one hand, we would be having the political bodies such as UN, uh, European Union. Then we will have some of the global NGOs such as uh, Greenpeace, for example, very few companies and includes that includes also the investment company BlackRock and then several individuals who would be uh, on one hand representing the uh, NGO or non-profit sector like Greta Thunberg and then politicians and then at the end uh, uh, Bill Gates, which is an interesting uh, which is an interesting observation because there is no single driver of the discourse in that agenda and it's not even the body who is uh, setting a lot of those standards which is European Union, which again creates an opportunity for intensified engagement and alignment. Then, uh, when we look at the at the, the at the terms more specifically, then obviously the European Green Deal is driven in the discourse more from the political perspective, and sustainability is driven more from the uh, interestingly enough uh, investment perspective, and net zero and carbon neutral and negative discussions are more centric around US. Then what it also means that uh, there is a space for the other actors to enter and lead that dialogue, which creates a lot of opportunities for engagement. It also creates a, a need of alignment within the organizations, how some of those terms are being used, especially when we look at the carbon neutral, negative, the net zero, etc. Because uh, in some organizations, you would see that they are used relatively freely as interchangeable, which is not necessarily uh, the case when you look at the definitions. So again, here, there is a great opportunity. On the other hand, it requires also a care in the way how the uh, how the discourse is being shaped and how the companies position themselves in that space. Then uh, what we see overall, and interestingly enough, uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, companies that wouldn't be necessarily the uh, usual suspects in the discussion around ESG being visible and not necessarily in a negative uh, manner. And they do have more mentions in the discourse than the uh, political bodies. However, there is no single company which would be owning any of the issues or any of the of the subjects. So again, that creates a great opportunity for the others to position themselves within that broader discourse. Um, then, looking from the uh, from the perspective of the of the political stakeholders, interestingly enough, uh, you will see that the discourse is driven very strongly by the by the by the EU, uh, with some level of the uh, of the involvement of the or visibility of the international organizations, which is again interesting because that suggests that the ESG discourse as ESG regulations are dealt more at the regional level and there is lack of the global joint and common framework that would be uh, that would be aligned across all the jurisdictions around the world. Um, in the other in the in the in the other of the of the of the studies that uh, that uh, that we that we published throughout the years with the first edition in 21 and then updates uh, last year we were looking at how companies and how organizations do navigate this uh, ESG agenda and we've seen really that there is this move from compliance to competitive advantage because from the ESG perspective with the alignments and the upcoming regulation in terms of the non-financial disclosure, there will be not that much in inverted commas that can be done uh, in terms of the reporting. So therefore the ESG moves towards the sustainability space uh, where that can create a competitive advantage for the companies. It allowed also to create an assessment of maturity levels and planning of the ESG journeys of the uh, companies and communications programs, and that also suggests the need for integration of sustainability in all communications activities, including regulatory and public affairs. And this is an important point because oftentimes sustainability communications or sustainability engagement within the companies would be considered as a separate 
bucket, so to say, or a separate set of activities or separate set of campaigns. And what we are seeing is that the companies that integrate the sustainability communications across all the channels and across all the internal and external activities are the ones who are the most successful in terms of their visibility and engagement in those subjects and driving and shaping the agenda. So again, integration becomes even more critical. And uh, looking at the uh, at the uh, broad ESG agenda, uh, again, the, both the customers and the consumers do favor holistic approach to sustainability, looking at the environmental, social and governance side. And when we are talking about ESG, oftentimes we tend to focus purely on the environmental uh, side of things and on the and more particularly on the climate change. However, the overall ESG agenda has broader scope and broader limit within the organizations and externally it includes also social and governance elements. While the governance elements uh, uh, appeared uh, uh, not to be top of the agenda a few years ago, actually our studies showcase that uh, are becoming more and more uh, visible. Think about the boycotts of the companies uh, following their decisions uh, after the uh, beginning of the of the war, etc. And then social side becomes also increasingly important with how the companies deal with the social issues, how do they position themselves on those social issues, and what are really their operations when you are looking, for example, on the human rights in the supply chain, etc. And all those elements need to be taken holistically into consideration. And oftentimes, companies do focus purely in their communication on the on the environment side of things which is a missed opportunity because looking holistically at the esg agenda actually allows to uh, showcase the uh, strategic differentiation and in order to approve that and analyze it last year we looked at the expectations from the european uh, consumers and customers looking at uh, four countries and 15 global brands and the study was looking at correlating different elements of the brand attributes based on the brand exit index which was developed by a, uh, by a by a research company from from Iceland which was looking at the different brand attributes and aligning the ones related to the respective elements of e so environmental social and governance elements and correlating them with the trust in the in the brands and what we've seen actually is that the highest correlation between the trust of the towards the companies and the per perceived performance of these companies was at the governance level so the companies that were perceived to uh, have strong government structures also act uh, ethically and aligned with their local communities did score also very high at the at the trust level and the correlation between the trust was the highest when it comes to governance, following by social, and uh, then at the end, environment. Obviously, it's a counterintuitive result, and we asked ourselves why uh, that might be the reason. And uh, uh, according to our to our second layer analysis, then the environmental side and the environmental part of the performance of the companies is something that is expected from companies uh, that they do. It is something that uh, is ingrained so much in the discourse that companies are expected to act on the uh, climate change and environmental issues, while the uh, issues related to the to the social and governance and the and the and the engagement in the communities were the ones where the difference could be made. So. Obviously, we also see that uh, this is uh, this is uh, not uh, not the only uh, study that was uh, done around the expectations of the of the customers in Europe. It is uh, on one hand there was this demand for the ESG positioning from the international investment community. There is also higher push on the from the regulatory perspective on actually substantiating the ESG claims be it by the financial institutions if you think about some of the fines that were given to the big investment companies who were uh, found uh, uh, 
uh, not aligning their claims in terms of the ESG and their actual portfolio. There is also this generational shift of wealth and the new generation is much more conscious and engaged in the ESG. And then obviously ESG is also essential element of the brand positioning. Um, then there are 47 billion in assets, which are under management, which are in the ESG related funds. Then 95% of millennials are interested in sustainable investment and 80% of Generation Z and millennials believe that companies should implement ESG policies. So again, it sounds to be universally important and universally relevant across all the groups of the of the of the upcoming uh, consumers and people in the workspace. So uh, ESG is also uh, not only related to the companies themselves, but it's really about the whole value chain of the companies. And it is uh, important because companies do uh, are held responsible for the performance across their value chain uh, within the scope which means also uh, from the climate perspective, the scope pre emissions so the ones that are not related directly to the operations of the company are within the protocol. And then also the European standards are cascading down to the uh, second and third tier suppliers all around the world. And it's really important because the ESG used to be perceived as the reporting exercise driven by the companies. And now it's really integrated throughout the uh, supply chains and value chains of the companies across the globe. So uh, looking at it, we did develop an ESG corporate maturity model, and we looked at the uh, different aspects, uh, uh, how companies differentiate themselves and what are the kind of behavioral patterns that companies do have in their ESG journey. And we actually identified five main patterns. So the beginning, the conservative, moderate, progressive, and leading, and a different strategic considerations coming from the organizational development and design down to the uh, communications. But what is really critical is that becoming really fit for ESG requires this integrated approach, which uh, looks at the organizational structures, the strategies, but also the tactical engagement and here again there is a, a great role that the public affairs function is playing so what is upcoming uh, for public affairs in terms of esg and sustainability we see that when we look at the uh, maturity models at the end of the day the external advocacy and reputation building and the leadership is really the top corner. So basically the companies that are benefiting the most from their sustainability and DSG engagements are the ones who are taking the leadership in their external advocacy and reputation building in the ESG agenda. Therefore, the function becomes really critical for the uh, success of those activities and strategies. And moving to the top definitely uh, requires a high level of involvement of the of the function in shaping that discourse. And in this uh, integrated approach, uh, what we are seeing are really the three steps approach. So what is really critical is to define the North Star and the destination of the company and really being able to see what is the ambition level. Then alignment which requires the ESG perception, risk assessment and, uh, and, and monitoring. And at the end, at the engagement level, the narrative communication and customer engagement. And again, this journey needs to be integrated across all the communication and external engagement communication channels. So this changing discourse is also changing the landscape. So we did see that ESG overtakes sustainability in the stakeholders uh, discourse. Uh, it can be seen that reporting did overtake the action that create now the opportunity for companies again to differentiate themselves at the level of uh, sustainability activities. Then sustainability is the term used by the consumers. So we are saying here this again, again, the perception gap between what uh, or expectations gap between what the uh, consumers are using and the way how consumers are thinking and then the ways how the companies are 
communicating about sustainability and bridging that gap becomes even more critical. Then the companies uh, move towards a segmentation of the ESG functions. So by creating more internal capacity in terms of ESG, which is a, uh, which is a great move within the companies, sometimes it leads to the a very siloed approach, which is uh, compartmentalizing the functions within the ESG and the communication uh, in the organizations, while there is an increased need for alignment. And then definitely the non-for-profit organization will also need to seek and verify their own sustainability performance. Because oftentimes when we think about ESG and sustainability, we think purely about the companies, but this a top aspect of concern also for non-profit organizations because they need to also be able to prove how their activities are uh, contributing to the uh, to the to the goals that are that are being set and also how from the operational perspective they Im- implement the sustainability principles to their operations so from the public affairs perspective and ESG agenda what is really important is to be ahead of the legislative and political ESG agenda and then being also able to drive and being the sounding board for the organization to really inform the rest of the organization and be that driver of kind of so what and next steps in the uh, in the upcoming years. Also supporting the organ- corporate strategy, linking the organizational narrative to the ESG agenda, which is also important that the narrative is really authoritative, unique, and it aims to co-create and co-shape the uh, the discourse and default leadership obviously can bring a uh, unique ESG knowledge of the organization. Finally, the storytelling allows to connect with the stakeholders and protect the license to operate. However, the ESG public affairs approach or communications approach shouldn't be limited to the storytelling because story uh, stories do support the narrative, but it has to be based on the strong fault leadership and the agenda. So at the end, the risk opportunities for this year and beyond, it is important to be aware of the uh, greenwashing. So doing the homework and establishing the facts, also measuring and managing the impacts, keeping the making the uh, business case. So uh, push back against uh, ESG evangelists and then also participating in the cycle of events this year and in the following years. So be it the World Economic Forum annual meeting, UN General Assembly, COP28 in Dubai, uh, etc. So to summarize the upcoming regulatory changes, and as we said, we create a, a more equal level playing field in terms of the reporting. It is a great moment right now to restart and rethink the sustainability communications and engagement approaches and bring that alignment across the channels within the organizations and public affairs function and communication function together are very well positioned to be the drivers of that change. So that uh, concludes the presentation and I will hand over to Philip to manage the Q&A session. Lovely, uh, Lucas. Thank you so much for that, uh, particularly with the, the the detail you provided, which was which was excellent. Um, so we've got a few questions in the Q and A tab. I can see. But let me perhaps start off with one of my uh, own to to begin with. Um, and I wonder if the three elements of ESG: environment, social, and governance, um, can be in conflict sometime, requiring choices. And I wonder how you would advise on making those choices. This is a very good, it is a very good question. I, I wouldn't necessarily think that they are in conflict. There might be a matter of of priorities, and and obviously they are, and that that leads to the two layers of priorities. So there are the priorities that are compliance driven. So in many industries, in terms of the E, there are the set standards what industries are expected to uh, to deliver. Then there. Are, However, you will see also that by creating, for instance, the market on the emissions side of things, the regulators do create a part where the E is linked with the G in a way, and that supports uh, the S at the end. I think the way of creating the choices and priorities is really about the, on one hand, analyzing the the industry, driving the 
uh, efficient materiality analysis from the perspective of the organization and then and then indeed prioritizing then you would say that the governance side is something that you would be expected as organization to have sorted in inverted commas however g starts to include more and more choices that corporates are uh, are, are taking during the for instance during the times of war etc so um it has to stay truthful to itself and then on the other hand link to the to the materiality analysis of the organization i would say good thank you for that um i have a question from azur who's in uh, ghana um and it's a, it's a question on priorities i think you mentioned right at the beginning the uh, all of the uh, un uh, sustainable development goals uh and of course the the one of one of only one of those is the goal of climate change um, and he's wondering what uh, what is the role of of the PR professional um, in 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 talking about climate change within the context of ESG, which encompasses perhaps some things that aren't as important. Well, I think the the SDG framework is an interesting one because it was an attempt to address different aspects of action that are needed to be done addressed at the at the global level and indeed the climate change was uh, was was one of them uh, definitely communication professionals can be the agents of change within the organization i know it's uh, it's it's easy to say but from uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, of of consumers and from the perspective of the link that communication and public affairs professionals are having with the external stakeholders, they can really be the ones who are driving the organizations towards taking those choices and towards dry and driving on one hand the internal change, on the other hand external engagement with the with the third parties and the and the consumers and this alignment then uh, really allows them to 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 be those important actors in this corporate context. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned earlier um, one of the issues about common reporting standards, of course, being a great challenge. Um, it's something that I have some experience of from a previous job I did in Brussels. Uh, and I wondered, do you know who, who are the main players in, in advocating for common reporting standards and, and perhaps even, even creating those standards? Well, there have been several initiatives and, uh, un, and I guess unsurprisingly, the big four accounting companies came together, I believe, in 2021 in oh. the in the context of World Economic Forum with the need of our alignment of the uh, of the of the standards. So they were the ones who were who were pushing on that together with the group of the companies around World Economic Forum. So that was one kind of set. Then you would have the set around the organizations like Global Reporting Initiative, which is obviously uh, in their important interest to bring that alignment and, uh, and, and to drive it towards their own standard. And then you see on the regulatory front, from the perspective of upcoming EU regulation on non-financial disclosure, which will include the mandatory disclosures for companies operating at the EU market and then progressively from the bigger to the, to the smaller ones, that's uh, uh, another push. So I would say you have like this, let's say, soft law and standard setting bodies who will obviously advocate for, for, for their standards to become the standard. Then you would have the a business community with a special uh, focus from the from the from the accounting firms, and then you had this uh, uh, third bucket, which is the regulatory landscape and 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 EU. And to a certain degree, the the latter one will be uh, creating this uh, this mandatory field for everyone, and then the other disclosures will be uh, will be will be add adds on to that. Okay, Duke. Uh, and so one final question. Uh, you mentioned uh, watch out for greenwashing. Um, and this, this reminded me of an exercise that uh, IPRA did um, this year um, and launched in, in, in January, um, which was a set of communication uh, guidelines um, for climate change. Um, and in one of those, we basically said, you should not do greenwashing. Um, uh, which is much, which I think is one of those things that's very easy to say and much perhaps less easy to, to do. Um, and I wondered uh, if you had any comment in terms of the, the, the challenges of, of giving advice to clients about greenwashing and, and indeed finding it out in the first place. Well, and also the threshold of what is considered to be greenwash 
to be greenwashing is is lowering so i would say that there are there are at, at least several layers to this question so there is a layer of uh, of compliance in terms of the claims that are being made by the companies and you would see uh, those recent fines in Netherlands and in uh, in UK towards the companies who are driving the marketing campaigns based on the sustainability messaging that was found by the uh, by the regulator uh, not aligned with their with their operations. So making sure that whatever is being communicated is aligned with the regulatory requirements. Then at the second level, that whatever is being uh, said by the company is backed with the data and either with the proofs. So, for instance, if the company communicates about, say, reduction of emissions, then there should be a baseline and there should be a reduction that can be proved in terms of the numbers that are being calculated and being also uh, at the third level, a bit prudent with uh, very long term sustainability ambitions communicated only as such. So if we are putting the horizon towards 2040 or 2050, we need to also ensure that we are able to communicate the plans and the progress that is being made towards those uh, those dates. Again, the greenwashing right now, uh, the threshold of what, what some of the non-for-profit organizations or consumers would uh, consider to be greenwashing is much lower than it used to be. So it's important really to also uh, scrutinize our messaging even, even more because uh, several years ago, basically greenwashing would have been the outward lies that company would make right now uh, not sticking to the to the proof points becomes greenwashing so it's important that we also scrutinize our messaging even more splendid uh, lucas thank you so much for that uh, there are no more questions so we can uh, end end the presentation um as i mentioned in the beginning it will be uh, up on our april website in a couple of days um for people to watch again or if you draw on the session late as i know a couple of people did um you'll be able to see the whole presentation over again um, at your leisure there so lucas thank you so much for uh, for today um and just to let everybody uh, who's listening know that uh, next month uh, 8th of june uh, we'll begin hearing from japan um and it's uh, K K kazuko kataki who is associate director corporate at edelman and she'll be talking about japan digital pr best practices so until then, I look forward to you and Lucas once again. Thank you so much for uh, today's presentation. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone.